So very good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to the Breakfast UM Health webinar series. I'm Dr. Sashila Ponam Palavana and I will be your moderator this morning. Today, in conjunction with the World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week, I'm honored to moderate a series of presentations aimed at deepening our understanding of antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance stands at the forefront of global health challenges, jeopardizing the effectiveness of essential medications. In May 2015, a global action plan to tackle the growing problem of resistance to antibiotics and other antimicrobial medicines was endorsed at the, uh, as, at the 68th World Health Assembly and countries, including Malaysia, adapted, adopted this global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. Its first objective is improving awareness and understanding of AMR through effective communication, education, and training. Organizing a global annual awareness campaign was identified as an activity to contribute to this objective. Thus, this annual campaign was established to raise global awareness and understanding on AMR and is celebrated from 18 to 24 November every year. The team of AAW 2023 is preventing antimicrobial resistance together as it was in 2022. This team underscores the profound reality that antimicrobial resistance is not a challenge exclusive to a particular group or region. Rather, it affects every individual across the globe in healthcare settings and community. In acknowledging this, the team emphasizes the shared responsibility we all bear in combating antimicrobial resistance. Prudent antimicro antibiotic, antimicrobial use and robust infection control measures play a pivotal role in preventing hospital-acquired infections and AMR in healthcare settings. Furthermore, due to the multidimensional nature of the battle against AMR, the involvement of multidisciplinary teams is necessary. Collaboration among healthcare professionals from diverse fields ensures a holistic approach in infection prevention and control and antimicrobial use. By bringing together experts in medicine, microbiology, biology, pharmacy, surgery, intensive care, nursing, IT, cleaning services, and other essential services, we can pool our collective expertise and resources to develop comprehensive strategies and address the multifaceted challenges posed by EMR. In line with this team, our esteemed speakers this morning promises to deliver comprehensive insights into the global landscape of AMR with a focus on Malaysia and the impactful strategies implemented within University Malaya Medical Center through collaborative efforts. In our first session, Dr. Anjana, uh, could you will provide an overview of antimicrobial landscape globally and in Malaysia and focusing on its implication. Following this insightful introduction, we will transition to ses session two, strategies in action, preventing EMR. We are privileged to have five speakers representing various disciplines within UMMC to share their experience and showcase the measures taken to reduce antimicrobial resistance and hospital acquired infections in our healthcare setting. From preventing clepsis and surgical site infection to controlling carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumani in the intensive care unit, our speakers will explore a spectrum of initiatives. The sessions will also touch upon the pivotal role of stewardship interventions and address the barriers and challenges faced by healthcare workers in uh, the relentless fight against AMR. Without further ado, I um, now uh, call upon uh, Dr. Anjana. She's an ID physician in University Malaya Medical Center. Though a junior, she's pivotal and uh, has shown very promising um, potential of becoming a great infectious disease physician. Uh, she has uh, played very active roles in infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship in our hospital. Without further ado, I call upon her to give her talk on the global landscape and of EMR as well as that in uh locally. So it's yours, Anjana. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof, for the kind introduction. A very good morning to esteemed colleagues and fellow friends. Thank you for the opportunity to kick off our World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week celebrations with a breakfast at UM Health slot. Today, I will be sharing the global landscape national as well uh, as some UMMC data on antimicrobial resistance and its impacts. 
So what, as I'm sure most of you would know, uh, antimicrobial resistance is a phenomenon which occurs when microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites change over time and no longer respond to the medications which were previously used to treat them, thus making infections harder to treat and increasing the risk of disease spread, causing severe illness and even death. As a result of drug resistance, there are adverse consequences to both the patients and the healthcare system. But how does antimicrobial resistance occur? Bacteria develop resistance by various mechanisms, and the two most common ways are selection pressure and via transmission of resistance genes from one bacteria to another. Images 1, 2, and 3 highlight how selection pressure occurs. Our bodies contain lots of bacteria, and with few of them being drug resistant. When we take antibiotics, the antibiotics will kill the sensitive bacteria as well as the good bacteria that protect our bodies from infection. And thus, this allows um, the resistant bacteria to flourish. Image 4 illustrates another mechanism of resistance, which is the transmission of resistance genes from a drug-resistant bacteria to another. But what's really scary here is that when, when a drug-resistant bacteria develops, the resistance can persist for as long as one year. There are various factors which contribute to antimicrobial resistance, including suboptimal um, rapid diagnostic, suboptimal vaccination, even inappropriate dosing. But the biggest drivers are really the misuse or overuse of antibiotics, both in humans and animals. And this is really where all of us play a part in preventing antimicrobial resistance. Why is AMR such a global concern? Well, there is a rapid global spread of multi- and pen-resistant bacteria which cause infections which are virtually impossible to treat. And whilst that is occurring, the clinical pipeline of the development of new antimicrobials is running dry. In fact, WHO has created this list of dirty dozen superbugs, which essentially is 12 different pathogens that are increasingly resistant to antibiotics. The list is divided into three sections, critical, which is the highest priority for research and development. And the bacteria in this critical group can cause bacteremia, so get into your bloodstreams, causing infection. And can cause severe life-threatening infections, such as pneumonia, as well as severe wound infections. High-priority pathogens are bugs that can cause severe disease and can spread very easily. And the bacteria that are in the medium-priority group can also cause a wide range of infections but they're in the medium priority because there are other options in deterring these infections, including immunization. So whilst there's this rapid spread of superbugs, there's also a real decline in the development of new antibiotics. In fact, as of November 2021, approximately 46 new antibiotics were in clinical development, with 18 of them expected to have some activity against at least one of the critical priority pathogens that I mentioned in the previous slide. But what's really important to highlight here is that although the numbers look promising, only one out of every five to 10 drugs that reach human testing will make it to FDA approval. So overall, the clinical pipeline and recently approved antibiotics are insufficient to tackle the challenge of increasing emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. Additionally, in low-income countries, uh, they are particularly vulnerable because the second-line antibiotics that are needed to combat the most resistant infections are often very, very expensive and not readily available. But MDROs are a global problem. It's not just a problem affecting Malaysia or our region alone. In 2022, a Lancet publication on the global burden of bacterial AMR in 2019 provided comprehensive estimated AMR burden to date. And you can see in this world map graphic, which illustrates the burden estimate of fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli, revealing its widespread, widespread presence across various regions, of course, with notably higher rates in South Asia. But this snapshot is just one facet. Here, you see the pervasive presence of MRSA, and here, carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumannii. So, together, these visuals underscore that multi-drug resistant organisms is not just confined to specific countries or region, but is indeed a global challenge demanding collective attention. But where do we really stand as a nation in terms of uh, multi-drug resistant organisms? 
I'm pleased to share with you the findings of the Infection Prevention and Control and AMR Containment Program Annual Report for 2022, which was published in June this year. This comprehensive report compiles data from the Ministry of Health Hospitals, as well as university hospitals, including University Malaya Medical Center and Ministry of Defense Hospital. In 2022, there were a total of 18,794 multi-drug resistant organism isolates. So this uh, represents both healthcare associated and community acquired. You can see that about 70% of them was, were healthcare acquired and 66.3% of them were actually causing an infection, which means that only 3% of them were colonizers. But what MDROs are we talking about? Well, these are the main six. And when we zoom in, the top three multidrug resistant organisms were Acinetobacter baumoni, followed by CRE, as well as Klebsiella pneumoniae ESBL. You can also see over the last six years from 2016 to 2022, there's a rise in Acinetobacter baumoni, uh, as seen in the red line here, as well as CRE in the green line here, with a slight increase in E. coli over the last year. What infections do these organisms cause? Well, the majority of hospital-acquired multidrug-resistant organisms, the infections were actually bloodstream infections, followed by pneumonias, both non-ventilator-associated as well as ventilator-associated, and subsequently skin and soft tissue infections, as well as urinary tract infections. Interestingly, among the multidrug-resistant organism patients, patients who had MDRO isolates, there was a significant number of them that had antibiotics exposure within three months of the MDIRO being isolated. And the top three commonest antibiotics were cephalosporin, beta-lactamase, and carbapenems. Where does UMMC stand? Well, we are grouped together here under university hospitals. And as you can see, uni hosp university hospitals have the highest hospital-acquired MDRO rates. Although this is uh, there is a decline from 2020 and 2021. And just please note that this is inclusive of both infection rates as well as colonizers. When we break it down to infection, PPUM actually is the second on the list in terms of hospital-acquired multidrug resistant infections at 0 0.98 per 100 admissions. This is largely driven by pneumonias. And actually, when we look at the breakdown of bacteremia targets, well, we are doing quite well in terms of achieving national targets, especially for Acinetobacter baumoni bacteremia, MRSA, and CRE bacteremia. And this is really due to various strategies and interventions, which my colleagues will be sharing with you later on. So you can see here, we are well below the targets for these three organisms, but there is still room for improvement uh, in terms of Klebsiella and, uh, and E. coli ESBL bacteremia infections. And this is something that we're continuing to work on together with everyone's help. So that was on the multidrug resistant isolates. How about our antibiotic use? Well, in the National Surveillance on Antimicrobial Utilization, which UMMC contributes to as well, uh, this shows an overall 3% increase in the usage of antimicrobials. Cephalosporins remain the major class of antibiotics used, followed by piperacillin tazobactam and carbapenems. Now, the impact of these infections, infections with MDROs, is catastrophic. It results in a longer hospital stay for patients, and these patients often require broader spectrum antibiotics, which have more toxicity and other sacrilege. Additionally, in some patients, more intensive care is required, and overall, there is an increase in morbidity and mortality. Infections due to MDROs also prove to be a significant financial burden to patients, society, as well as the healthcare system due to the cost of treatment and the loss of productivity. In fact, WHO recently published this study, uh, which, which was a published this document, which was a collaboration with the University of Hong Kong, and is the first to quantify the health and economic impacts of antimicrobial resistance in the Western Pacific region, so in our region. So they use data from the last 10 years, 2010 to 2019, to model the data for the current 10 years, 2020 to 2030. And you can see that in the worst case scenario, if we don't do anything, there would have been almost half a million deaths in 2020 with a projected cumulative total of 5.2 million AMR-related deaths in these 10 years. 
there will be 172 million extra days um, in hospital. And I can't even begin to imagine the number of zeros here when this is converted to our local currency. But in addition to the significant economic repercussions, there is a vital patient-centric aspect in addressing antimicrobial resistance. Our institution is taking proactive steps to raise awareness about AMR among the general population. Spearheaded by Ms. Vedika Bhatt, a PhD student under Prof. Sashila and Prof. Cindy's supervision, this initiative involves interviewing patients and their families directly impacted by MDROs. Their stories will be featured in an upcoming publication, emphasizing the personal and relatable nature of antimicrobial resistance. Sharing some excerpts from previous interviews, a patient said, Before, I'm so happy I can drive car, I can go out, enjoy and have lots of friends. Now, I have lost everything. A fellow colleague in UMMC shared that her son had clap pneumonia infection trending towards the resistance strain. And she said, even though I am a medical doctor, but seeing your son in NICU having apnea in front of you is very traumatizing. This could be you or me or any of our loved ones. And so we must together work towards combating antimicrobial resistance. How do we do that? The WHO recommends a people-centered approach to addressing antimicrobial resistance in human health. With five foundational steps and four pillars to support, we all have a role in preventing AMR. Additionally, the WHO has introduced the AWARE antibiotic classification, where antibiotics are categorized into excess, watch, and reserve groups, so three different groups. The excess group includes antibiotics for common infections and should be made readily available. The watch group involves those with antibiotics which have a higher resistance to, de to develop to have higher resistance potential. So these antibiotics, when used, have higher potential to develop resistance. And the reserve group comprises of last resort antibiotics, which are used only in essential and critical situations. This strategic approach aims to guide healthcare professionals and policymakers in promoting responsible antibiotic use. As we recognize the multifaceted challenge of antimicrobial resistance, it's crucial to understand that University Malaya Medical Center is unwavering in its commitment to combat this global threat. Our approach is comprehensive and utilizes multimodal strategies to address the complexities of AMR. Together with teamwork and management support, support from the top management, we have been able to collaboratively institute multiple initiatives, as you can see here, um, SSI, education training, hand hygiene. You'll be hearing about some of these initiatives from my colleagues shortly. Before I end, I would just like to share and invite those interested to participate in our upcoming third antimicrobial resistance symposium, which will be held in early December, 4th and 5th December this year. As a university, it is imperative that we share knowledge across borders by inviting researchers worldwide to share ideas and collaborate, echoing WHO's recommendation to celebrate Antimicrobial Awareness Week. As we move forward, it is essential to remember that each one of us plays a vital role in this collective effort. Together, we can save lives and prevent further escalation of AMR. Before I hand over to my colleagues, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who has contributed to these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anjana, for that comprehensive and insightful talk. And I hope you know it has it, it has sent home uh, very significant messages to our listeners. Without further ado, I would like to present our next speaker, uh, Miss Ravi Chandriga uh, Atura Rajulu, who um, with, who will be presenting to us a, a title of her talk, which is Radiology Advances: Pioneering PICC Line Infection Prevention. So, Ms. Uh, Ravi Chandriga is a radiographer, uh, radiographer officer performing administrative duties, clinical research activities in UMMC. She's actually a close friend and colleague of mine, and I work closely with her in so many initiatives. And, and I, you know, she's, uh, I, I would say, you know, she's, if not, 
she's better than many of our own doctors when it comes to improving patient safety in our hospital and, and I have great admiration for her. She's also the Chief Internal Auditor of Q, uh, QMS ISO 19901205. She was recently awarded the Excellence in Biomedical Imaging Award in the Allied Health Sciences field during the Venus International Healthcare Award, Bihar in Chennai, India. She has also won actually many other awards for her infection prevention initiatives and she is my go-to person when I have an issue with infection prevention in the radiology department whether it's hand hygiene or line related infection and she's very very proactive and and you know um, I, I really must say you know I can't think of a better person to give this presentation uh, to actually inspire uh, all of you out there uh, on how we can actually reduce uh, preventable infections in the hospital. In fact, she has published these papers and I've shared it with my friends in UMMC and also in the Ministry of Health and and, and she is uh, and it's very um, exemplary. So the floor to you, uh, Chandrika. Thank you very much, Prof. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Prof, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Ravi Chandrika and I'm from the Department of Biomedical Imaging. And today I'm very happy to share with all of you my topic, which is Radiology Advances, Pioneering in the PICC line, Infection Prevention. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all my co-researchers, -re which have lined up here. And hang on, yeah. it's not moving. Just give me a minute. Okay, these are my contents. Now, healthcare acquired infections or HCAI affect one out of every 20 to 30 patients in the United States of America, and these are all preventable. And the prevalence of HCAI is 4.5% of 100 admissions based on our national data and central line associated bloodstream infection, or better known as CLEPSI, is the most common and it's fatal HCAI with the use of peripherally inserted central catheters or PICCs. Now, PICCs is inserted via the peripheral veins and the tip is positioned as superior vena cava. And this is used for repeated access to veins for long-term medication treatment. As an example, chemotherapy, blood draws, nutrition, and this may stay in place for weeks or months. Now, the growing use of pick lines uh, for long-term medication and treatment. This has led to the increased risk of CLEPSIS. Based on some literature review, uh, about 6 to 8.2% of peak lines uh, actually develop infection. For inpatients, 2.1 per 1,000 catheter days, and for outpatients, 1 per 1,000 catheter days. However, in 2019, based on our unpublished data, in the surgical ward, the uh, CLEPSI was 11.5%, with an infection rate of 4.4 per 1,000 central line days, which provided attention for us to reduce. Now, pick line, uh, we have infection. It could be extraluminal via the catheter tract contamination, or it could be intraluminal due to the heart contamination. Now, the mortality rate is 20%, uh, meaning to say one out of five patients may get CLEPSI based on our based on the Institute of Healthcare Improvement data. So Comprehensive Unit-Based Safety Program, or better known as CUPS, is one of the strategies for the reduction of CLEPSIs. Now, CUPS is adopted from Johns Hopkins University, and uh, this was supported by Agency for Healthcare Research, and uh, it's called as AHRQ. Well, um, CUPS can improve teamwork and safety culture. It helps clinical teams uh, to learn from our mistakes and the integration of safety practice into our daily work. So the objective of, of, of our study was to evaluate the impl implementation of CUPS uh, framework for the reduction of PICC-associated CLEPSI. Uh, based on our literature search, uh, Peter Pronovos, he has done uh, a study in uh, ICU using the CUPS model and he has actually sustained 66% of the CLEPSI. And, in, and was in, this was maintained for 18 months. And another study in 2010, he, act, uh, he went on to uh, apply the CUPS model and sustain another 18 months, and this could substantially reduce the mobility and cost. Well, CUPS implementation in 
and 350 institutions in 22 states in the US has resulted in 35% reduction in CLEPSI. And this also has reported, some has reported zero or near zero rates. Therefore, we have set this as our benchmark for our study in PPUM. Now, the CUPS um, method that we applied in our study was divided into three uh, phases, which were phase one, which is the pre-CUPS, uh, where we looked into our pre-intervention data and we implemented the CUPS, okay, and then we went on to sustain them. Now, if we look at the sustaining um, category, we have 3A. We have one uh, without the technical intervention, which, which is the silver alginate dressing. And we also moved on with the silver alginate dressing. This is an add-on to sustain our CUPS. And this was approved by University of Malay Medical uh, Center Research of Ethics Committee. Now, we look at the phase one. We actually got all our CUPS teams. Then this is a multi-collaboration um, effort from the Department of Biomedical Imaging, Infection Control Team, Nursing and Surgery. One thing good about CUPS is it uh, dovetails uh, quality improvement tools and we can use lots of quality improvement tools. So therefore we applied Plan Do Study Act to develop the framework of our project and we applied the five steps. Now we look at CUPS, we have five steps that we can apply in our strategies to reduce the infection. Now, step one will be to understand and train our staffs on the signs of safety. So we educate our personnel through training sessions. We create awareness on safety. We assemble the team, as I mentioned earlier, we empower the individuals to address and improve safety. We engage senior executives to do the walkabout and so that we focus on the patient's safety and well-being. And we identify the defects through our sense making. We gather uh, a a uh, group of effort, uh, effort um, group of uh, people who are well trained, who are who, are, who, who knows how to manage certain certain re, uh, pre prevention strategies, and we discuss about it. So we create sustainable safety improvements, and we implement teamwork and communication strategies. So we also apply QI tools like fishbone diagram to identify various stages of the peak placement process which should contribute to the development of CLEPSIs. We identified a few solutions. Okay, as you can see here, we actually went through all the categories as, we, as seen in the Ishikawa earlier, and we looked at the root causes. We offer solution. So the CUPS team verified all, accepted all the solutions except for procuring um, additional ultrasound machines. So it did this, we had some financial constraints. So we applied whatever resources that we have, we moved on with our study. And we also looked into our existing workflow. We looked at how we could re-engineer them. So we looked at the activity that we normally don't do or we do and how we can re-strategize it. So we can see all those um, in red. Uh, we, we have actually implement, implemented the chlorohexane bath, dressing standardization. We created patient education leaflets. We also established safety rounds by other international radiology team. So after the insertion of pick lines, we do a 24 hours uh, round with our team and also 48 hours just to monitor the line. And we have a checklist to go through with our patients. We also empower the patients to, to, to manage and also to take care of their lines. And so we had uh, sessions where we educate our staffs. We gave them education on how to standardize the dressing. We also did demonstration in the ward. So we did a few activities on the, this is into the sustaining phase. And we also came up with a video so that everybody understands how to apply the um, dressing so that everything is standardized. Now, silver alginate catheter dressing, uh, it has got um, ionic, um, ionic silver alginate. It has got broad, with broad spectrum antimicrobial effectiveness and this is applied to prevent contamination for external bacteria. So besides applying the CUPS model, we also went and explored whether we can apply the technical, another technical solution to bring the infection further down. We had our measurement outcomes. So we analyzed our CLEPSI rates. We also looked into our device utilization ratios and we measured quarterly both the device days and the patient days and we used the medical calculator to analyze our, and we compared all with our baseline period. 
So we had a total of 213 patients from a surgical ward, which was um, included in our study. And mostly were male, uh, average 61 years old. And most of the patients were inserted with pig lines with for prolonged antibiotics. If you look at this graph here, we can see that um, it actually significantly increased, uh, it dropped and it significantly increased, uh, increased during the COVID period. However, after we applied the technical solution, we have actually brought it down. So all in all, we had like we had a zero clapsy days, uh, almost 84% during our study period, which was 39 months. And here we can see that we had actually from the baseline, we actually has we have dropped after we implemented the rate ratio per device, this has dropped. And after we sustained the cups, it has dropped further to 0 0.5. And this was statistically significant. Well, we really looked at the patient days within uh throughout the study period. We also had um we had from the baseline it increased a bit during the sustaining period. However, with the additional solution, the sustaining period was due to the COVID. And uh, with the technical solution, we actually brought it down uh, below the baseline. We also found the device utilization ratio was increasing. This graph actually depicts, although the device utilization ratio increased by 60% over the three-year period, the CLAPSI rates showed their declining. So we managed to bring it down to 45%. Our benchmark was 35%. So this was a, a very good success story for our entire team. So the CAPS implementation with appropriate tools has successfully reduced the CLAPC rate, which is 45% in the medical uh, imaging department. And this is sustainable, which is similar to Pono Wars et al. And this program has reduced complications and ensured patients' well-being, which may eventually help conserve resources and also reduce our healthcare costs. If it possible litigation, and litigation can escalate up to millions of needs. And CAPS is an effective tool for engaging frontline personnel in QI initiatives. So in conclusion, CUPS intervention was effectively implemented and reduced the PICC associated CLAPSI and the technical intervention added to the CUPS framework led to reduction with sustainable improvements. And this only caused minimal and uh, which required potentially the outcome is large impact on the PICC associated CLAPSI, which could be life threatening. And thank you. I would like to I would like to thank all my co-researchers, the department, staff department, department of infection control, surgery, nursing, and also the management of UMMC, for their kind support and contribution towards the execution of our project. These are my references, and we are going forward to aim towards zero peak associated club C. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Andrika. That was excellent. I never get bored of listening to your talks. It's so inspiring. And I, you know, okay. I still keep, keep coming back to you to, to learn all this stuff as well. Um, shall we keep the questions to the end? Uh, just some, some not, not the questions to the end. I think, uh, you know, the, I forgot to put this down as housekeeping. But everyone who has any questions, please put your questions in the chat box. You may put up your hands, but I think it's better for you to put in the chat box and uh, we could answer your questions from there. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, please do that. As we go along, we'll answer the questions. Thanks, Chandrika. So now we'll go on to our second talk. Uh, uh, this presentation will be from uh, Sister Siti Shuada Samsudin from the Infection Control Department. Her talk was titled Surgical Innovations, Reducing SSI Using a Multimodal Strategy. So Sister Shuada is... Uh, as I said, currently working in our infection control department. She's got eight years experience in infection control and she's passionate in preven prevention of EMR. And when I say passionate, it's an understatement. Uh, she's truly passionate. She's very proactive in all the work that she's done. And she's been instrumental in driving the SSI interventions with our surgeons uh, and uh, in, in this multidisciplinary uh uh, innovation or uh, interventions in a hospital to improve patient outcome. So with that, I hand hand over to you, Shu, to give this talk. Thank you. Good morning and assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, Prof. Shashila, for the kind introduction. So today I will uh, uh, share with you uh, share with you surgical innovation using SSI using a multimodal strategy. 
Surgical site infection is an infection that occurs after surgery in the part of the body where the surgery took place. SSI is the most frequent type of hospital-acquired infection in low-middle income countries with an infection rate of 1.2 uh, to 23.6 per 100 procedure. SSI pool incident in low-middle income countries at 11.8% versus high-income countries at 1.2% to 5.2%. SSI pool uh, incident in Southeast Asia is 7.7%. Uh, the Incident Prevention and Control and Antimicrobial Resistant Containment Program 2022 annual report showed that SSI is in the top four in Malaysia with a, with a rate of 9.82%. Uh, we knew that we had to take action and there was an emergency to prevent SSI among our surgical patients in UMMC. We are using a WHO multimodal improvement strategy to guide us to embark on intervention to decrease the SSI rate in UMMC. We did a risk assessment and gap analysis. We formed a multidisciplinary team consisting of senior management, uh, clinician nurses from OT and wards, anesthetists, infection control and pharmacists. The roles and responsibility of each team member were stated uh, such as the surgeon will coordinate and oversee the surveillance as well as uh, ensure the SSI bundle is followed. The infection control department will coordinate, facilitate, train and feedback on the SSI data to the team. OT staff such as scrub nurses and GA nurses will fill up the SSI bundle checklist and ensure uh, the bundle is followed intraoperatively. We identify the barriers. Uh, that might contribute to failure, such as absence of local standard operating protocols of, or an implementation manual for SSI prevention. We develop guidelines uh, <coughs> and checklists based on local and international guidelines. From the guidelines, we select the top five strategies that we can impl implement in our settings, such as pre-operating body, skin preparation, hair management, antibiotic pro 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 sorry, prophylaxis within 60 minutes before insertion, documentation of redosing appropriately. We ask ourselves what is the exact burden and rate of SSI and what are the gaps in our practices. To answer the question, we need to conduct a baseline assessment of the current situation. It is important to develop a realistic action plan and highlight strengths and weaknesses. We use a standardized data collection from uh, formed together baseline data. We speak to all relevant uh, stakeholders such as surgeons, nurses and use the EPSIC assessment tool to determine the current surgical practices related to infection prevention and to identify gaps and barriers for improvement. The baseline data uh, and gaps in practices were presented to multidisciplinary team and key leaders. Based on the baseline data and WHO SSI Prevention Guideline 2018, we develop SSI prevention bundle consists of pre-operating budding, uh, bath one day before and before surgery, hair management, shaving is strongly discouraged at all times, but if necessary, to use clippers. Skin preparation using chlorhexidine to percent in 70% alcohol, surgical antibiotic prophylaxis within 60 minutes before insertion, and documentation of SAP reducing appropriately. We established the project charter, which uh, had the problem statement, our mission statement, the, imp the importance of the project, and the individual members with their roles and resp responsibility, <clears throat> and how we could monitor the progress, desired outcome, and a can chat. The project charter also includes the benefit of this project to the patient, organization, and other stakeholders. With the aim uh, of seeking approval, commitment, and endorsement for hospital leadership, this intervention was, was presented at various management meetings, including HIACC, uh, MAC meeting, and OT subcommittee. To evaluate the effectiveness of our intervention, we conduct a follow up assessment using the same tools in step two. We use the SSI surveillance perioperative data collection form by WHO. We focus on the outcome measure, the SSI rate, and the compliance with the SSI prevention bundle. Good communication uh, with, uh, between various stakeholders is very important. Regular meeting will help every six weeks initially, and then the frequency becomes lesser once we improve. During the meeting, the SSI rate gaps and uh, sorry gaps in practices, challenges, and barriers were discussed. 
since the roll out of the intervention, I am happy to say that we have successfully reduced the SSI rate in our hospital. We started uh, SSI prevention uh, for ORIF in 2018, reduced by 31%. Uh, mastectomy reduced by 30%. Uh, CPS reduced by uh, 15%. Neurosurgery reduced by 26%. And LSCS reduced by 7, 64%. To sustain, to sustain the SSI prevention activities and improvement in UMMC, we gradually uh, integrate the integrate of SSI bundle into routine clinical practice by putting in the bundle EMR, in EMR. We also make it compulsory for the healthcare worker to educate the patient on the prevention of SSI using patient education and information leaflets uh, pre-operatively. We always revisit all five steps of intervention and multimodal strategies systematically to keep focus on ongoing improvement plans. Apart from reduction of SSI rate, we have also successfully presented abstract at various conferences uh, in, uh, in Malaysia and internationally. In summary, the implementation of this multimodal prevention measure using evidence-based intervention that was decided by the team show a significant reduction of surgical site infection among surgical patients in UMMC. This surgical innovation would not have been successful without the 100% involvement, determination and understanding of the importance of patient safety among the respective team. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Shu, for that excellent, excellent talk. And I must say, you know, uh, uh, infection control plays a small part, but all those people that Shu acknowledged at the end are the real kaki tangan who worked hard to put this together. And this really highlights how important, uh, what is the how important the role of a multidisciplinary team is in uh, in in preventing SSI and you. Can you can see the tremendous reduction was based on the efforts of all these dedicated people in all these teams. They came from ICU, the nurses, OT nurses, um, and, and our management have been great in, in supporting this. So we'll go on to our next talk. So again, uh, uh, I will ask you to please put in your questions in the chat box and we will answer your questions at the end of the, the talk or in between if there's any pressing ones. Our next speaker is... Uh, Mohammad Fikri bin Ahmad is our new kid on the block, actually. Uh, he's a pharmacist. Fikri started his career in Unisti Malaya Medical Center since 2017 and served at the Drug Information Center Unit and Outpatient Pharmacy. Then he later joined the inpatient unit where he gathered his experience as an antimicrobial pharmacist in 2021. He's currently pursuing his master's in clinical pharmacy. At present, he's the ward pharmacist in Neuro ICU, CICU, where he spear spearheads the AMS rounds. Uh, I must say Fikri has... Uh, uh, is is very very passionate actually about EMS, very proactive, and it's such a pleasure to have him on board with us in our growing family of antimicrobial stewardship to combat antimicrobial resistance in UMMC. Without further ado, I will hand over the mic to Fikri. Assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Sheila, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Fikri. I'm a pharmacist from the Department of Pharmacy. And today, I'm happy to be sharing with everyone on the lessons which I've learned personally from the stewardship rounds uh, based on the opportunity given to me for the past two years. So uh, I think the first start, the first step is always good to get a glimpse into the antimicrobial resistance crisis. And my uh, infectious disease ID doctor, uh, Dr. Anjana, has, uh, has given a very good uh, background of AMR. I'm just going to touch a bit how AMR is actually dangerous. Back in the pre-antibiotic era, infectious diseases accounted for the top three causes of death. People would easily die due to a simple and minor injury, and they had a very short lifespan. So sooner after that, the, we entered the antibiotic era, whereby the penicillin was first discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming, followed by over 20 new classes of antimicrobials that have been discovered. At the point of time, slowly, gradually, the antimicrobials have become more accessible. And people around that time has improved life expectancy for about 80 years. And slowly, uh, resistance bug has creeped into the era, which will then lead to us. Where are we, where are we today now in the post-antibiotic era, whereby AMR is happening now and it's no longer a prediction of the future. And we have two very few antibiotic labs in the pipeline. So 
we are actually going backwards to the time whereby infectious disease were very deadly. Hence, there is a pivotal need for antimicrobial stewardship, which is a coordinated program that promotes the appropriate use of antimicrobials. Our three main primary goals for AMS are first to improve patients' outcomes, to reduce collateral damages such as reducing spread of drug-resistant pathogens and antibiotic-associated diarrhea. And the third would be to reduce healthcare costs, whereby, for example, a more extensive drug-resistant infection contracted to a patient would incur more healthcare costs to acquire the more expensive antibiotic for the cure. And that is what we as pharmacists are seeing more and more as we go by. And the idea of AMS is not something novel or new. It has been first mentioned in 1945, where Sir Alexander Fleming warned on the overuse of penicillin, which will eventually lead to resistance in his Nobel lecture. And in today's world, a systematic review and meta-analysis has uh, clearly elucidated the benefits of clinical and economic perspectives of hospital-based approach or implementation of EMS program, at which it was found that hospital-based EMS programs are very instrumental to reduce, uh, sorry, to improve the total antibiotic use, to reduce the use of restricted antibiotics, to reduce the antibiotics used within critical care settings, uh, furthermore, they also further reduce the overall antimicrobial cost and also will reduce the hospital length of stay. Into our narrow scope, which is in PPUM or UMMC, few AMS rounds initiatives have been embarked and currently active and ongoing. Kabapendam round AMS was started in 2017 after the establishment of the first AMS round long ago, which is in ICU. Uh, which was then followed by orthopedic AMS and general medical round, uh, which is in, which uh, were introduced in 2019. And this year, we are very... Um, just give us a minute. We're having a little bit of technical problem and we'll get back to you just shortly. Uh, but in the chat box, I uh, do see... Uh, question. Uh, sorry, not in the chat box. Again, can I just say that if you have any questions, please put it in the question and answer box. And we have one question. Uh, do you have it? Oh, sorry. We'll come back to that. I think Fikri just sent me. So what do I do? Except. Oh. Okay. Okay, never mind. Reach send to Wani. All right. Okay, so I I've got one question. We have one question here. Uh, maybe Anjana, you can take you can answer it, and I can hop on. Could the high and uh, from uh, Professor Y K Chan, uh, could the high multi antibiotic resist drug resistant phenomenon in our hospital be due to the fact that a fair proportion of them are referred patients from outside hospitals? Uh, Anjana, uh, you want to give a go? Yeah, thank you for the question, Prof. Um. Actually, can't uh, hear you, Anjana. You have to put on the volume. Hello, can you hear? Okay, me? sorry. Go on. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, referrals from other hospitals do contribute, but actually, a significant amount comes from UMMC itself, and this could be contributed by various factors like use of broad spectrum antibiotics, um, patient factors as well, uh, immunocompromised patients, and patients who keep coming in and out of hospital. Uh, so, yeah, uh, patients who come from other hospitals do contribute, but actually a significant amount is from our own centre. And we do have, uh, we do distinguish that when we collect the data as well. Yeah, I think many of them, you know, due to prolonged hospital stay, uh, due to invasive uh, procedures, this increases the risk. That's why we need to be, I think that makes it more important for us to be more compliant to our infection control measures to prevent what we can. Uh, I hope that answers the question, Prof. Thank you. Uh, Fikri, are you ready? Okay. Okay, sending. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly. It's always a small technical problem. Um, any other questions? Okay, sorry everyone for the trouble just now. All right. Next, uh, just uh, another round of um, introductions for the AMS round initiatives in PPUM. So we first started our AMS rounds in ICU a long time ago, uh, prior... Uh, wait, uh, this is the old slide. Uh, sorry, everyone, hang on. Uh. 
Sorry. Okay. Sorry about this, guys. But I think uh, Fikri has got to uh, do a bit more work on his... Uh, right. Sorry about this. Fikri needs to do a bit more work on his IT stuff. So I think we will go on to our next speaker first. Uh, and, and this will be Dr. Noor Alwani Biti Sulaiman. She's actually my right-hand person in the infection control department. I must say I can't live without her. So she's the medical officer in infection control. Uh, she received a degree in medicine from University Science Malaysia in 2016 and joined infection control department since 2022 as a medical officer. She recently uh, received a certification in infection prevention and control from the Certified Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology from US. And she's also and she's very passionate uh, about um, uh, infection prevention and empowering healthcare workers uh, in uh, preventing infections. So without further ado, I now give, uh, I, I present Wani, who will be giving her talk on ICU innovations, championing the battle against carbapenem-resistant acinotobacter baumani. All yours. Sorry, I was muted just now. Thank you, Prof, for such a good introduction. Um, my name is Alwani, and uh, I'm a medical officer from the Infection Control Department, and I will be talking about the next strategies in action to prevent AMR together. And my topic is championing the battle against carbapenem resistant acinetobacter baumannii or AB, in the intensive care unit. And I will be presenting on behalf of the ICD and the general ICU. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize as the topic that I'm going to present today is not on CRE, but it's actually uh, it's on CREB. Carbapenem resistant Acetobacter baumannii or AB are bacteria resistant to nearly all antibiotics and difficult to remove from the environment. Acetobacter baumannii can cause infections in the blood, in the urinary tract, and lungs or in the wounds in other parts of the body. It can also colonize patients, especially in respiratory secretions such as sputum or open wounds, and these patients can shed CRAB into the environment which can contaminate surfaces and shared medical equipment. Given the difficulty of eradicating CRAB once present in healthcare settings and the emergence of strains that cause infections with transmissible carbapenemous genes and limited treatment options, the threat level of CRAB was raised to urgent in the 2019 Antibiotic Resistance Threat Report uh, published by the CDC. As mentioned just now, we can see that CRAB, CRAB infections are highly associated with prolonged hospital stay and device-related infection and has become a major concern in IC worldwide. Thus, in preventing and reducing CRAB, other than the treatment strategies for CRAB, awareness in IPC measures are important too. CDC has reported reduced in CRAB by 33% with multimodal strategies applied in their healthcare settings such as preventing device-related infections like CORTI and CLAPSI and use of appropriate antibiotics. In 2017, WHO has published its first ever list of antibiotic-resistant priority pathogens, which is divided into three categories according to the urgency of need for new antibiotics. As you can see in this slide, uh, the most critical group of all includes organisms that pose a particular threat in hospitals and among patients requires devices such as ventilators and catheters. One of the critical priority pathogens, as you can see here, is the CRAB. So why CRAB are considered critical and pose significant challenge? First, it is not always clear if CRAB is a colonizer in ill patients due to underlying host status or if it is represent a true pathogen capable of contributing mortality, leading to uh, uncertainty about the need of antibiotic therapy. Secondly, once acinetobacter baumannii exhibits carbapenem resistance, it generally has acquired resistance to most other antibiotics, leaving few remaining therapeutic options. And finally, there is no clear standard of care antibiotic regimen for CRAB infections. In the same report released by the CDC, although the CRAB cases in the US has reduced since 2012, however, CDC estimated there were still 8,500 cases among US hospitalized patients in 2017, resulting in 700 deaths and nearly $281 million in excess healthcare costs. In Malaysia, referring to the IPC and AMR containment program 2022 report by MOH, as been reported by Dr. Anjana just now, there was a decrease in CRAB cases to 0 0.21 per 100 emissions, with the indicators set at less than 0 0.3 per 100 emissions. 
However, CRAB has emerged as a primary nosocomial pathogen in outbreaks in most MOH hospitals, and last year, Acinetobacter bulmonary was the highest HA MDR reported, and MOH has also highlighted in the report that it is crucial to evaluate current approaches to controlling the transmission of Acinetobacter bulmonary. In order to combat CRAB in the ICU in UMMC, we have applied WHO multimodal strategies in improving IPC measures. The measures are build it, teach it, track it, sell it, and live it. In practice, this means the use of multiple approaches will contribute to influencing the behavior of the ICU staff towards the necessary improvement that will impact on patient outcome and contribute to organizational culture change. The first strategy is build it. By providing the equipment, infrastructure, and supply needed in the area and for the staff. Like example, in order to combat CRAB or any MDRO, hand hygiene always had become the first in the IPC measures list. Ease of access to hand rubs at the point of care and the availability of wash infrastructures, including water and soap, are important considerations. Together with the ICU team, we have adapted the VAP and CLEPSI bundles. We also created a protocol on environmental cleaning, plus all the patients in the ICU are based using the University Correct Sitting Building to prevent HAI. Other than that, starting early this year, ICU has become the first one to initiate the use of ultraviolet C disinfectant machine, which is used as an adjunct to minimum cleaning of any room in the ICU. Secondly, proper training and education to the healthcare workers are given continuously at all levels of categories like doctors, nurses, cleaners, together with the ICU nursing team. Our ICU nurses has been working hard with the ICU team on giving education on hand hygiene and PPE use. Module on infection control measures such as hand hygiene, line bundle were put online so that all the staff can learn at their own pace. Other than that, infection control and the facility team work together to ensure that cleaners are trained for cleaning in the ICU. Thirdly, we believe that communication is the key in order for all these strategies to work and feedback should work both ways to improve our communication in combating infections and AMR. Like example, the number of MDR cases were fed back to the ICU staff and together we monitor the MDR cases. This feedback session was done during AMR rounds and tracked by the ICU team using the MDR robot to instill awareness among staff in the ICU. Hand hygiene, PPE compliance, and environmental audits results were informed to the ICU link nurses and sisters, as well as sending an official report of hand hygiene compliances to the head of uni. Next, promoting and reinforcing the messages and reminders are vital in reducing CRAB in ICU. These visual cues were put near the hand washing sink and at the patient's room door as well as the workstation in order to increase awareness and remind all the staff the importance of complying with infection control measures. Catheter insertion and maintenance checklists were also put in the EMR. Last but not least, instilling a safety climate and cultural change to the area. As a part of patient safety, the ICU team has initiated comprehensive unit-based safety program cast this year together with UMMC Deputy Director as one of the team members. Yeah. Other than that, the team has also reported the MDRO cases, including CRAB in the meetings held with the management such as critical care subcommittee meeting with hope that actions taken will be accelerated and to get more buy-in to combat this matter. As a result, we can see that from 2021 to September 2023, the number of CRB cases in ICU has been reducing in trend. We believe that the multimodal approach in infection prevention and control, including the ICU and ICT, hard work has played a major contributing factor in combating CRAB CRAB in the ICU. Before I end this presentation, I would like to point out that CRAB has progressed as a leading cause of HGI worldwide, particularly in ICU, is spread and multiple drug resistant uh, considerably impedes the treatment of critically ill patients. Mm -hmm. On the basis of epidemiology and antibiotic resistance, the combined application of multiple interventions can effectively control the emergence and spread of CRAB, as well as provides hope for the control of CRAB infections in the ICU. We admit that it is indeed a long journey and we have never reached the end yet. Certainly, the implementation of control measure is of crucial importance has to be extended to other wards for the eradication of CRA from hospital, or in other words, FPC is everybody's business. I would like to thank the infection control team, ICU team, and the nursing team in the ICU for an invited support given by both teams in order to make this happen. 
Thus, I would like to humbly urge everyone, let's accelerate action together in preventing HAI and AMR to make our facility a safe place for the community now and in the future. With this, I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Awani. I think without further ado, I will now hand over to Fikri to, to, to continue his presentation. Uh, thanks, Prof. So I will just continue back to the part which I left. So in PPUM, few AMS ROS initiatives have been embarked and still ongoing. Uh, we first started uh, with ICU AMS, which then followed by Kabupaten Rounds in 2017. Then in 2019, uh, we started to kickstart orthopedic and general medical uh, AMS in 2019. And then this year, we are lucky for the given opportunity to collaborate with Neuro ICU, CICU and the Plastics team to conduct their bedside AMS rounds in their respective wards. And then for the rest of the presentation, I shall focus on uh, Kabapenam AMS. So in our Kabapenam AMS round, uh, it is consist of infectious disease physician and, and AMS pharmacist, where the pharmacist will undertake the post prescription the post prescription review for all patients started with meropenem within forty eight hours. Exclusion is given there in the slide. Then we're gonna uh, we're gonna assess the appropriateness of the meropenem and then document in the EMR. The patients will be closely monitored for their clinical progress, infective markers, and culture results. Then prompt referral to ID team will be made in the event where intermediate interventions need to be carried out. And then to further strengthen our AMS initiative, we monitor for the clinical outcomes, acceptance of the interventions, the infection and mortality rates. So then let's discuss some of the interventions carried out in AMS. Too often, there has been connotation that AMS only encourages for stopping the antibiotic, which is not true. We also indeed ask him for other things. Uh, to, we did recommend like to IV to PO switch, dosing. We even allow for broadening of the empirical, empirical coverage. And to some cases, we also advise continuation of antibiotics. So this will be the summary for the four years of our meropenem AMS uh, round, whereby we are seeing improvement in acceptance rates and appropriateness in terms of the, year, in terms of the use. For the top three indications for meropenem use were respiratory infections, bloodstream infections, and also urinary, urinary tract infections. For the main reason of inappropriate initiation of meropenem was due to wrong choice. And the most common for the final inappropriateness uh, was due to wrong duration. We also look into the acceptance rate and safety perspective of our intervention. We found that AMS interventions uh, acceptance and appropriateness improve with time. The cause of this were also further studied in the in those groups whereby the primary team accepted our interventions. And the cause of that were, were actually due to non-infection related or due to infections not covered by meropenem, such as fungal infection. So it is actually a multidisciplinary work. And when we do that, the patient definitely get, gets to win. So everyone can actually be the good antimicrobial steward for, for, for prescriber. We, uh, they can help by actually making accurate diagnosis, which is very important, and then following the local antimicrobial guidelines, taking cultures at the appropriate times and regularly, regularly reviewing the need. And then for the nurse, by timely administration of antimicrobials in the ward. And then, of course, we have to uh, educate our patient for taking the courses as recommended. And then for the team in the sitting in the AMS team, we need to continuously develop the guidelines uh, for the use of our hospital staff and keep going on, keep doing the supporting audit and feedback for prescribers and educating the prescribers. Last but not least, before I end my session, I would like to share one good example how continuous AMS effort is indeed is not a wasted effort. As we all know, overuse of third generation capoloscoring is high in Malaysia and kefaparazone is frequently employed as a surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. So based on our findings for the annual point prevalence survey uh, in 2022 and 2023, we are, sh uh, we are seeing an improvement in terms of the SAP choice whereby used to be kefaparazone, but in 2023, kefazolin is preferred. This data, this data also, although it's just a from point prevalence survey based on one day, it is indeed very encouraging and highlighting for more joint collaboration for everyone. Therefore, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to those teams who have been very supportive and receptive for our initiatives to improve uh, patients' outcome and reduce and resistance. We very much welcome for any teams who are looking forward to engage with us to kickstart AMS in their rounds, sorry, in their wards, because we cannot accomplish all this by us only in the AMS team. We need to work together. Thank you, everyone, for the kind attention. Thank you very much, Fikri. Very well said that, you know, it takes a whole village to 
combat antimicrobial resistance. So without further ado, I will now we will now proceed to our final talk, which is going to be presented by Dr. Wan Nuliana Wan Ramli. Her talk was going to be Young Doctors Chronicles Hand Hygiene Insights Among House Officers. Dr. Nuliana is a is an internal medicine lecturer from the International Islamic University of Malaysia and a clinical specialist in Sultan Ahmad Shah Medical Center. She's currently doing her infectious disease training subspeciality in University of Malaya. Her research interests are in antimicrobial resistance, MDRO infections, tropical diseases, and HIV. Uh, so, Liana, without further ado, I, I will pass over to you. Assalamu alaikum and good morning. I'm Dr. Liana, one of the infectious disease trainee uh, from UIA, but currently training in um, ID unit PPM. Thank you, Professor Sheila, for the kind introduction. So I'm going to share you about the Young Doctors Chronicle Hand Hygiene Insights Among House Officer. So uh, why hand hygiene matters in healthcare setting? Of every 100 uh, hospitalized patients at any given time, 7 in developed and 10 in developing countries will acquire at least one healthcare associated infection and up to 2 in every 5 cases of HAIs are caused by cross-infection via the hands of the healthcare workers. And the promotion of good hand hygiene actually improves compliance and reduces the risk of this uh, healthcare associated infection by 60%. So in PPUM, our infection control department has um, implemented multiple hand hygiene interventions according to the WHO multimodal um, um, strategy. So uh, we uh, employed a system change we uh, do a hand hygiene certification. We train the trainers by training the ward uh, uh, link nurses as well as um, uh, other uh, nurses in other hospitals as well. We educate the healthcare workers, the new staff, especially the house officers, and train them to do a proper hand hygiene using videos, using um, uh, ed uh, exercises, hand hygiene exercises frequently. We uh, engage uh, on the multi level with management, with the hospital, KP KPI, with the ward and department hand hygiene champions, such as the matrons, um, the specialists, the medical officers, and everyone uh, involved. And then the IC nurses actually will do a hand hygiene audit for monitoring of the compliance and feedback to the other, uh, to the respective teams. So if you look at the picture, we have uh, our alcohol-based hand wrap at patient uh, uh, bedside, outside the patient room. We have put the posters for reminders of hand hygiene. We have put the poster for hand wash at the, at the sink. We uh, uh, make sure that uh, all our healthcare staff um, actually do the hand hygiene module where they will get a certificate. Uh, we will audit and feedback to them uh, about their hand hygiene compliant and we educate and train them. So. However, we uh, from uh, in 2022, we see a declining trend of hand hygiene compliance among house officers in PPM to less than 60%. As you can see in the graph, uh, blue is 2022 and uh, orange is 2023. You can see that in 2022, it ranges between 50 to 59%. It does improve slightly to 60% in 2023, but still overall hand hygiene compliance remains insufficient. So, um, uh, we actually do a study in uh, among the house officers uh, in two phases to find out what are the causes of hand hygiene, uh, low hand hygiene compliance among them. So uh, the phase one is actually to assess the level of uh, knowledge, attitudes and perceptions uh, of hand hygiene among house officers in PPM. And the second phase is to find out or to identify key barriers and facilitators influencing the low hand hygiene compliance among the house officers. So the phase one study where we do a facility-based cross-sectional survey conducted in September 2022, we actually circulated an online survey modified for, uh, from a standardized WHO knowledge, attitude and perception questionnaire. And out of 371 house officers that were working in uh, PPM during that time, 75 responded to the survey. So um, mean age of the house officers are 26 and 88% uh, are in their first year of uh, house officer training. 87% actually attended the training in IPC and 97% are aware of the presence of PC guideline. Most of them, 99% aware that the uh, healthcare worker can transmit organism from uh, their hands to patients and 100% 
did a good job on routinely use uh, alcohol-based hand rub. The results of the knowledge and attitude in hand hygiene, when we calculated the mean total knowledge score is actually quite low, 10 out of 25, and the mean total score for attitudes is actually low as well, 48 out of 54. 87% did follow the correct hand hygiene step. However, we noted that 68% has poor compliance after touching patient surroundings. And among, the, among 75 doctors, 54 of them actually face barriers during hand hygiene. 79% um, agreed that hand hygiene is effective in preventing HAI, and 75% perceive hand hygiene as important in the institution. However, only half of them considered HAI has an impact on patient's clinical outcome. 70% agreed that uh, administrative leaders played a role in promoting hand hygiene and all of them considered that their own effort in hand hygiene is important in patient care. And in terms of uh, measures that effectively improve the hand hygiene compliance, 85% felt that the strategic uh, uh, and availability, uh, widely availability uh, of alcohol-based hand rub uh, is uh, effective in uh, improving the hand hygiene compliance and 52% found that the reminder posters also is as effective. Mm -hmm. And majority agreed that the hand hygiene audit and educational activities conducted did improve their practices. And so from a uh, conclusion from this KAP survey that we saw that knowledge and attitude scores in hand hygiene are still low among these junior doctors and this emphasizes the importance for further improvement in hand hygiene education and training. And then we proceeded to the phase two to uh, find out the barriers and facilitators uh, in hand hygiene among house officers in PPM, where we actually do a focus group discussion using a nominal group technique where we actually uh, pick uh, selected 10 house officers uh, from the hand hygiene non-compliant list and we actually uh, did uh, one session of nominal group technique uh, within an hour. So nominal group technique is a, is a new technique uh, where we actually um, do a silent generation of ideas and subsequently we will do a round robin um, uh, giving out ideas and af after that we will rank the ideas uh, to the top uh, three uh, I, uh, most uh, important uh, barriers. So the top three barriers in hand hygiene from the uh, NGT were the first one was heavy workload. The second one, they had inadequate time to perform hand hygiene. Um, and the third one was the blood taking trolley was not well equipped. And they feel that uh, the accessibility of the hand rub on cardiac table, backside and blood taking trolley facilitate their hand hygiene. If they have sufficient workforce, they can focus more on doing the hand hygiene moments and by Getting a gentle reminder by an infection control nurse also will facilitate their hand hygiene compliance. And they actually recommended to have constant reminders from their ward nurses to remind them to do hand hygiene, direct gentle feedback from the IC nurse to correct their hand hygiene in real time, and ward nurses to assist them in procedures so that they don't miss their hand hygiene. So in summary, from these two, uh, in this, uh, from this project, from the two phases, where hand hygiene compliance rate is still low among house, house officers, which is evident by their low KAP scores, and their top barriers to comply is due to heavy workload, inadequate time to perform hand hygiene, and blood taking trolley is not well equipped. And these insights emphasize the importance for further improvement in hand hygiene education and training of junior doctors, reinforcing frequent reminders and communication, as well as system and culture change. I would like to acknowledge these people that uh, this project will not be able to, to be completed. Uh, the house officers in PPM are, who are involved in both phases. There's Dr. Siti Zaira and Dr. Awani were the medical officers for the IC unit. Ms. Arubani is a research assistant who kindly helped with the data analysis. Sister Susanna and all the image control nurses, Associate Prof. Rafsa from SPM, uh, Pro Sharifa and Pro Sashila for the infectious diseases, all the ID team and also the PPM management. Thank you for the contribution to Saving Lives. And uh, we're going to have, uh, after this, the launching of the World Hand Hygiene Day, a World AMR Awareness Week. So uh, I would like to kindly uh, invite everyone to attend this. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Liana, and thank you for telling that. I wouldn't have said it better than this. And and I think this this project is very important, understanding uh, why people don't do things and trying to improve our interventions based on uh, this uh, social behavioral aspects of things. We, we, we have not studied this enough, and I think part of implementation, we need to under, understand this more. So now, uh, to end this session, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to all the speakers for the inspiring talk and excellent work that they have done to improve patient outcomes and make healthcare a safer place in UMMC. Uh, anti Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week 2023 serves as a poignant reminder that preventing antimicrobial resistance is a task that unites us all, necessity, necessity, necessitating collaborative efforts within healthcare settings to safeguard the effectiveness of antimicrobials and ensure patient safety and a healthier future for generations to come. I hope that this session has proven beneficial providing a deeper understanding of the challenges posed by antimicrobial resistance in our setting and inspiring everyone to contribute actively in its prevention. Uh, with that, um, you know, uh, we are really short of time, but, you know, each and one, every one of us are in the hospital. You can always ask your questions throughout the week as part of Awareness Week, and we hope you'll be actively contributing to uh, the activities that we have. Uh, with that, I thank you, and we close this session.